In part one of this three-part series on mechanical ventilation, we're going to be discussing ARDS ventilator management. My name is Bill Miller, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose with regard to the subject matter of this presentation. After graduating from Butte College Respiratory Therapy Program in Northern California in 1978, I moved to Sacramento and began working at the University of California at Davis Medical Center in Sacramento. I worked there for 30 years and retired. During that time, I was also working for Kaiser Hospital part-time. I worked there for seven years. And 25 years ago, I began teaching mechanical ventilation at Napa Valley College in Napa, California, and at American River College in Sacramento, California. Until the late 1990s, we believed that the ventilator for an ARDS patient was simply supportive. There, we didn't know that we could uh, do anything with the ventilator to improve outcomes for those patients. Uh, some of them would survive and some of them didn't. And, um, and then in the 1990s, we started learning about ventilator-induced lung injury and how we were causing harm to the patient uh, with our ventilator. And then from that, we had to learn lung protective ventilator strategies. In order to provide safe mechanical ventilation for ARDS patients, it's important that we understand all the ways that the ventilator can cause lung injury in the ARDS patient's lungs. Only then will we be able to apply lung protective ventilation. Ever since we began ventilating patients with positive pressure ventilators, we have known that the ventilator pressures can cause injury to the lungs, and we call this barotrauma. Uh, but it wasn't until the 1990s that we learned that there are other ways that the lungs are traumatized by the ventilator. Uh, one of these is called volutrauma, which is an overstretch injury, and adelect trauma, which is an injury that results from the open and collapse and open collapse of alveoli, where uh, the great numbers of alveoli open on inspiration, but on exhalation they collapse. And so that's one of the reasons why we use uh, PEEP is try to stabilize the lung and prevent that collapse on exhalation. Now the volutrauma and the adelic trauma uh, both cause uh, inflammation and they also recruit uh, these pro-inflammatory cells, the neutrophils and the macrophages that accumulate in the lung and cause a more injury, and that is called biotrauma. And most recently, there was um, a discovery that a patient breathing too vigorously on the ventilator can cause self-induced lung injury, and that's called patient self-induced lung injury. So we're gonna talk about all of these types of injuries and things that we might wanna do to try to um, alleviate all of this. Ever since we first began to ventilate patients with positive pressure ventilators, we've known about bar trauma. Barotrauma means that the pressure from the ventilator has caused alveolar rupture and there is an air leak. So that could be a pneumothorax, a pneumomediastinum, pneumoperitoneum, subcutaneous emphysema. Any of those would be uh, called barotrauma. So what pressure is it that causes this barotrauma? Is it the peak inspiratory pressure? Is it the uh, plateau pressure, the mean airway pressure, the PEEP? What pressure do you think it is that causes the, the barotrauma? Well, the peak inspiratory pressure is a pressure measured outside the patient. The mean airway pressure and the PEEP do cause problems, but mostly the problems they cause is with uh, cardiac output. The pressure that causes over distension of the lung is the transpulmonary pressure, otherwise known as the alveolar distending pressure. It has been suggested that we limit our uh, transpulmonary pressure to about 20 to 25 centimeters of water pressure. However, everybody doesn't agree with that. Uh, Dr. Gattanoni, who really knows a lot about this stuff, all about ARDS and lung protection and lung injury, uh, he says that the transpulmonary pressure should not exceed 22 to 23 centimeters of water pressure. And those that are more conservative 
uh, recommend that we keep our transpulmonary pressure less than 20 centimeters of water pressure for lung protection. To determine the transpulmonary pressure, we need to know alveolar pressure and we need to know pleural pressure. The alveolar pressure is not so difficult to measure. We just simply do an inspiratory hold maneuver and measure the plateau pressure. The plateau pressure is alveolar pressure. However, uh, pleural pressure is a little different. We can't put a manometer in the pleural space uh, without causing a pneumothorax. So we put a manometer in the lower third of the esophagus. The change in pleural pressure is reflected all across the thorax and so since the lower third of the esophagus is a thoracic structure changes in pleural pressure uh, will be able to be measured looking at uh, the esophageal pressure change. So in order to measure the transpulmonary pressure you have to have some technology and um, only about 1% of hospitals use esophageal manometry or have the ability to do that in their intensive care units. But some of our newer ventilators have that technology built into the machine. So if uh, the technology is being used by the people who have those machines and if the uh, physicians and the respiratory therapists learn how to uh, use and interpret the data, f that technology will help to protect patients from the ventilator, mainly by being able to monitor the transpulmonary pressure. This transpulmonary pressure, the alveolar distending pressure, uh, not only causes barotrauma, it also causes a condition known as volutrauma. In the ARDS lung, there is great numbers of alveoli that are collapsed. The proteins in the pulmonary edema fluid deactivate surfactant and many alveoli are affected by that and many alveoli are not affected and uh, remain normal. So some of the lung is collapsed and some of the lung is nor has normal compliance. So when we deliver the tidal volume into that lung, it's going to favor going into the alveoli that are already open that are the most compliant. So since the lung is very small that we're ventilating, it's easy to try to deliver too much volume to that very small lung. And that is called volutrauma, this overstretch of the alveolus. And again, Esophageal manometry is a good way to monitor and uh, prevent this volume trauma. When esophageal manometry is not available, then we must be careful with our plateau pressure and not let it exceed 30. Keeping the plateau pressure less than 30 will help to minimize uh, the volume trauma and the barrel trauma. Also, we need to be aware that in severe ARDS, there may be so much collapse that the lung we're ventilating is very small and we may need to go to 5 mLs or even 4 mLs per kilogram on our tidal volume. The ARDSNET trial was published in the year 2000 in the New England Journal. It was a very important study. It was the first uh, study that showed that if we use larger tidal volumes and higher pressures, we had worse outcomes. So in that study, they compared tidal volumes of 12 mLs per kilogram to tidal volumes of 6 mLs per kilogram. Well, 6 mLs per kilogram is a normal tidal volume for people. And 12 mLs per kilogram was considered usual care. Our textbooks back then all said that when we ventilate a patient, we should use tidal volumes of 10 to 15 mLs per kilogram. That's double the normal tidal volume. And the reason why uh, we were told to use 10 to 15 mLs per kilogram is because that was in the literature that started in the uh, anesthesia literature when they first started intubating people and providing positive pressure ventilation. Uh, they found that if they doubled the tidal volume, the CO2 was better and they had less post-op atelectasis and other kind of complications. So that just wound up in the literature without any, any kind of study being done. 
Uh, it also in the control group in that study, the plateau pressure had to be less than 50 compared to plateau pressure less than 30. Uh, we had done a lot of animal studies showing that if we kept the plateau pressure less than 30, we had uh, less lung injury. So why did we uh, ventilate our patients with uh, plateau pressures of 50? Because this is with usual care. Uh, the textbooks recommending uh, that we uh, no, go no higher than uh, 50 on our plateau pressure. Well, that came from a study using cadavers where they uh, wanted to see how much pressure it took to pop the lung. And they found that in cadavers, the lung would pop at a pressure of about 60. So they figured that 50 would be the highest safe level to ventilate patients. And back then, if uh, the plateau pressure had to be higher than 50 to make the CO2 normal, uh, the pressure would be increased. So patients were being ventilated with 60, 70, 80 centimeters of water pressure, all to try to make the CO2 normal. And the results of that study showed that the control group had a much higher mortality than the study group. There was a significant difference in, in mortality. And since then, uh, we've all been instructed to follow the ARDSNET strategy, the 6 mL per kilogram and the plateau pressures less than 30. Now, something interesting from that study <coughs> was that um, the patients who had the best blood gases were the patients in the control group. They had the worst outcomes, but the best blood gases. So that sh tells us that um, we need to focus on protecting the patient from the ventilator uh, more than try to make the blood gases normal. We need to treat the patient, not the patient's blood gas. And here's an example of what we did before ARDSNET. See this tidal volume? 934. Now that is uh, just way too high. We would never do that today. But back then, our goal for our ARDS patient was the patient's blood gas. Tidal volume, 934, 10 to 15 mLs per kilogram. Our pressures were, all, were under 50, barely under 50, and we thought we were doing the right thing. Dr. Gattanoni gave us some insight into this um, lung size in ARDS. He called his paper the baby lung concept. And what he was saying is that uh, due to all the collapse, the lung that we're ventilating in most ARDS patients is about the size of a five or six year old child's lungs. And he further went on to uh, explain how that the compliance is linearly related to the baby lung dimensions. So the smaller the lung, the lower the compliance. And uh, we used to think that the pa patient with ARDS had stiff lungs because um, the, the ARDS made the lung stiff. But Gattanoni says that isn't true at all, that the compliance of the lung that we're ventilating has normal compliance. It's not stiff, it's just small. Consider uh, normal compliance for an adult male is higher than the normal compliance for an adult female. And it's not because the female has stiffer lungs, it's just that they're smaller. And that continues all the way down through pediatric size uh, patients. Uh, you see the lung compliance getting lower and lower, but the lungs are not getting stiffer. They're just getting smaller. And so Gattanoni says uh, that instead of using mLs per kilogram ideal body weight for uh, patients with ARDS, we should uh, tailor the tidal volume to the size of the lung that we're ventilating. If a patient has a very severe ARDS and very small lungs, 6 mLs per kilogram might be above their total lung capacity. So that patient would need to have a smaller tidal volume, um, more like 5 mLs per kilogram or 4 mLs per kilogram. And he says 
The smaller the baby lung, the greater is the potential for unsafe mechanical ventilation. There is a linear relationship between the compliance of the lung and the lung volume. For instance, if we had a mild ARDS, we have shunting, we have collapse, so our lung is going to be smaller than normal, and our compliance is therefore going to be lower. If the ARDS is worse, and we call this moderate ARDS, the lung is going to be even smaller because there's more collapse, uh, more shunting, and the compliance is going to be lower still. In the very severe ARDS, the lung is very small and the compliance is very low. And remember what Gadon only said, I'll say it one more time, the smaller the baby lung, the greater is the potential for unsafe mechanical ventilation. So these patients here are very high risk for a lung injury from our ventilator. Uh, all of these patients are at risk from injury from our ventilator, uh, but these guys are gonna be the most difficult to manage on the ventilator safely. Prior to 1994, the term ARDS stood for the Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome until the American and European Consensus Conference, which was a group of uh, North American, South American, and European physicians who met to uh, come up with a good definition for ARDS and discuss things like how we might treat it and um, uh, all other issues with ARDS. And they're the ones that changed the name uh, from the Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome to the Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And up until then, we didn't really have a good definition of ARDS. Uh, patients with um, uh, congestive heart failure might be diagnosed as having ARDS, and patients with ARDS uh, being diagnosed with uh, congestive heart failure, and the patient with pneumonia uh, and developed ARDS and never would, may not have never called it uh, ARDS. So they came up with a definition for us for ARDS. And their definition said uh, that the patient has acute and sudden onset of severe respiratory distress. So that was one of the criteria for defining ARDS. They had to have bilateral patchy infiltrates on a frontal x-ray. And there was no left heart failure. And to demonstrate there was no uh, left heart failure, the patient had to have a wedge pressure less than 17. So the patchy infiltrate suggested uh, pulmonary edema and the wedge pressure less than 18 uh, said, well, this is not due to left heart failure. So this is ARDS. So ARDS is a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, they went on to describe uh, the severity of the ARDS. They called a PF ratio of 300 to 200 acute lung injury, and PF ratio less than 200 was ARDS. Now there was some problems uh, that we did began to discover uh, as time went on. Um, this uh, acute and sudden onset of severe respiratory distress, what is acute, like this morning or yesterday, day before yesterday? Uh, there was also a problem with the uh, patchy infiltrates on a frontal x-ray. Uh, there was a a big disagreement among pulmonary physicians uh, examining x-rays determining who had ARDS and who didn't. And uh, we really pretty much stopped using the pulmonary artery catheter so we weren't seeing wedge pressure. Also patients uh, in ARDS can also have left heart failure so they have a combination of cardiogenic pulmonary edema and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And this uh, PF ratio of 300 to 200 being ALI, well, it, they said, well, this is all ARDS. And they came up with a, a, a group of physicians to meet like the uh, AECC conference. Uh, and they met in Berlin, Germany. And it was called the Berlin definition. They defined acute onset as being within one week and the patient also had to have a known cause of ARDS. So a known cause of ARDS within the last week. And instead of the patchy infiltrates, they said they had to have bilateral opacities on a X-ray or preferably a CT scan. And the PEEP 
greater than five They define the severity as being mild, moderate, or severe ARDS, again, based on the PF ratio. So mild ARDS uh, replaced acute lung injury, that term went away, and the PF ratio 300 to 200 would be considered mild ARDS. If the PF ratio was 200 to 100, they call that moderate ARDS. And when the PF ratio was less than 100, that was termed severe ARDS. They also published in their paper um, uh, mortality rates based on um, uh, previous studies uh, looking at ARDS and they determined that a mild ARDS had a mortality rate uh, averaging 27 percent. That's pretty high mortality, a fourth of those people not surviving, but they call that mild ARDS. And the patients with moderate ARDS, mortality was 32%, severe was 45%. So you can see as, this, as the severity of the ARDS gets worse, so does uh, mortality rates. So if we put these two charts together, the uh, <coughs> Berlin definition of severity and mortality and compare that with what Gattanoni said about the lung compliance and the lung volume being uh, uh, linear in their relationship as the ARDS is worse and the smaller the lung. So uh, the patients with a mild ARDS would have <coughs> small lung volume and they would have low compliance. If the uh, <coughs> PF ratio was even worse, the 200 to 100, the mild ARDS with a higher mortality, the lung was even smaller and therefore the compliance would be lower and the severe ARDS would have very small lungs and very low compliance. So when the PF ratio is less than 100, we know our patient is going to have very low compliance and he's going to have very small lungs. And remember what Gattanoni said, I'll say it again, the smaller the baby lung, the greater is the potential for unsafe mechanical ventilation. Six mLs per kilogram may exceed the total lung capacity for this patient right here. So we probably going to be going down to five mLs per kilogram, four mLs per kilogram, and this patient would also be more likely to be a candidate for ECMO. Do you believe that most patients who die of ARDS die from sepsis or multi-organ failure? Or do you believe that most patients who die of ARDS die of lung failure? And do you believe that proning should be used for patients with PF ratio less than 150 or should we use proning for um, all patients with ARDS? And driving pressure, uh, uh, do you believe that driving pressure is an important uh, variable for us to measure in ARDS and use to optimize the mechanical ventilation? And do you believe that a patient with ARDS breathing spontaneously can cause a self-induced lung injury that is the same as the lung injury from mechanical ventilation? The answer to all those are true. And so for the next uh, several slides here, we're going to talk about all of these issues and talk about why they are true. Driving pressure is the pressure that drives the inspired tidal volume. The driving pressure is the plateau pressure minus peep. And if there is auto peep, uh, minus the total peep. Uh, Dr. Amato just published some results of a meta-analysis that showed that the driving pressure separated the survivors from the non-survivors better than did tidal volume or plateau pressure. And the, the number that separated the two groups was 15 centimeters of water pressure. So it is now um, widely accepted that we keep our driving pressure on our ARDS patients less than 15 centimeters of water pressure. So here's an example of how we would measure
the driving pressure. In this scalar waveform, the pressure versus time waveform we're looking at right here, uh, this dotted line is zero. This is 20 centimeters water pressure, 40 and 60. So to measure the driving pressure, first we have to do an inspiratory hold maneuver. So we delivered the breath and we did our inspiratory hold right here. So our plateau pressure is 20. And then we simply subtract the PEEP, which in this instance is 6 of PEEP. So 20 minus 6 would be 14. The driving pressure in this patient would be 14. And that would be an acceptable level for driving pressure. Driving pressure is also useful in PEEP titration. Because if we turn our PEEP up and the driving pressure goes down, that means we recruited lung. If we turn the PEEP up and the driving pressure uh, increases, that means we are um, over distended. We did not recruit any alveoli. And here's uh, an example. If, uh, if we have a patient who has a PEEP of 15 and his plateau is 28, his driving pressure is 13, right? 28 minus 15, uh, driving pressure of 13. So we turn his PEEP up to 17 and measure the plateau pressure, and it's still 28. Now what happened to our driving pressure? It went down. That means we recruited the lung. We, the lung is, is more open now. If we had done the same thing uh, with a PEEP of 15 and a plateau of 28, driving pressure 13 and we increase the PEEP to 17 but the plateau pressure goes to 32 now our driving pressure is 15 the driving pressure went up with our increase in PEEP that means we did not recruit it means we are over distending the lung uh, sometimes you in a severe ARDS you uh, may find uh, that you find the best PEEP and the driving pressure is more than 15 and that tells you you should turn down your tidal volume to 5 mLs or uh, 4 mLs per kilogram. So now let's add driving pressure onto this chart we already looked at, uh, uh, comparing uh, the mortality rate with the PF ratio and the severity of the ARDS uh, compared to the compliance and the lung volume from Gattinoni's work. And we see that if the the driving pressure is higher than normal, then uh, th we have a, a small lung and this patient uh, has a mild level of ARDS. The driving pressure in this patient may be no more than uh, 10 or so. If the patient has smaller lungs, then the driving pressure is going to be even higher. And if he has the very small lungs and the very severe ARDS, his driving pressure is going to be very high. So we can look at this and, and tell that uh, if we look at any one of these things, like the compliance is low, we can assume that this patient has a smaller lung and he's going to have a higher driving pressure. His severity, he has PF ratio uh, 200 to 100, and he has mortality of about 32%. Anyway, I think it's useful to have a, an understanding of how all of these things are related. And as the patient becomes sicker, the lungs get smaller and uh, there is changes and it reflects changes in the lung volume and the compliance and the mortality and the PF ratio. And one more time, uh, I think this is very important. The smaller the baby lung, the greater is the potential for unsafe mechanical ventilation. We use PEEP on our ventilator to recruit lung to improve oxygenation so we can turn our FiO2 down to a safe level. But there's another reason uh, why PEEP is useful for ARDS. We want to try to avoid a lung injury called atelect trauma. If, for instance, the PEEP is too low on our ARDS patients, we have a lot of collapse. And on inspiration, great numbers of alveoli are recruited. But then, because we don't have enough PEEP, on exhalation, those alveoli collapse. And then the next breath they open, they collapse, open, collapse. And this repetitive alveolar collapse and expansion causes lung injury and causes inflammation. And this injury is called atelect trauma. Uh, 
So we want to adjust our PEEP up to where we recruit as much lung as we can and we don't have collapse during exhalation. The injury to the lung caused by the volume trauma and the atlic trauma activate the immune response. And then there is a release of mediators caused by injurious ventilator strategies. And these uh, pro-inflammatory mediators are causing more injury to the lung and that's called biotrauma. These inflammatory mediators in the lung can get into the bloodstream and then they begin to affect uh, downstream organs causing injury to uh, kidney, liver, gut, uh, anything downstream. This inflammation can cause harm, injury, and even death. The majority of ARDS patients that die, die from multi-organ failure. They die from multi-organ failure because of the biotrauma, which was caused by the atelect trauma and the volume trauma with, that is caused by our ventilators. So a lung protective ventilator strategy is not only protecting the lungs, but it's protecting all those other organs. In an animal study using rat lungs, they were ventilated for two hours with large tidal volumes, volume trauma, and without PEEP. So that allowed the collapse and expansion, collapse and expansion of the alveoli, and that's atelect trauma. And what they found after two hours of ventilating them with these injurious ventilator strategies, they saw large increases in all of these cells and pro-inflammatory mediators that um, cause the increase in a lung injury and increase in downstream organs. In a study with humans who were randomized to receive traditional or lung protective ventilation, they found that uh, the patients that were receiving the lung protective ventilation, ARDS patients, the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines were lower in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid and in the plasma, in the lungs and in the bloodstream. So again, when we use lung protective ventilator strategies, we are reducing those uh, cytokines and pro-inflammatory cells that are causing uh, the downstream organs to fail, the kidney, the liver, the gut. Intense inspiratory efforts may exacerbate lung injury. We call this patient self-induced lung injury. And it doesn't matter if the patient is breathing spontaneously with no assistance from the ventilator, whether he's breathing with pressure support or assist control with volume control breaths or pressure control breaths or uh, in SIMV or even in uh, airway pressure release ventilation. ARDS patients often have a heightened drive to breathe. The patient may want to take larger tidal volumes and uh, can cause that overstretch injury because he doesn't have a lung to accept all of that tidal volume that he's trying to get. He's breathing with a baby lung. And so he can cause over distension and the same injury that would result from our ventilator giving too big a tidal volume. This can also occur with double triggering. Uh, the patient makes an inspiratory effort and triggers the ventilator to give a breath and you set the tidal volume to be uh, six mLs per kilogram, but he's still breathing in at the end of inspiration and triggers a second breath. Now he's getting a double tidal volume uh, than the ARGENET tidal volume. This all can result in lung inflammation and biotrauma. The patient sometimes is not synchronous with the ventilator. The eye time on the ventilator is not the eye time that the patient wants. The flow is not the flow that the patient wants. The patient may have a lot of auto peep and have trouble triggering the ventilator. This causes the patient to have a lot of distress.
the patient working too hard on the ventilator can suffer respiratory muscle fatigue. The diaphragm fatigues easily. And if you fatigue the patient's respiratory muscles, uh, it will cause his muscles to be very weak and he won't be able to breathe spontaneously if you extubate him. Another problem that can occur with these patients making these intense inspiratory efforts is called uh, negative pressure pulmonary edema. He actually makes such an inspiratory effort that it draws um, blood from the capillaries. There are important advantages to having the patient breathe spontaneously while he's on the ventilator. Uh, one, we uh, avoid using these paralytics and uh, sedation like the benzodiazepines. Uh, those things can leave the patient very weak for a prolonged amount of time, and especially if they are uh, continuously paralyzed for several days. The uh, other problem with those is the psychological problems that they find with patients who have been uh, paralyzed on a ventilator. A uh, significant percentage of those patients wind up with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Also, um, it's important for the diaphragm to continue to work because it atrophies pretty quickly. It's been shown that the diaphragm atrophies significantly in only 24 hours of disuse. So we uh, have the patient breathing on the ventilator, whether it's in assist control or pressure support. Uh, as long as he is making inspiratory efforts, he's giving his respiratory muscles all the exercise that they need. Uh, there's a common belief that if the patient is in assist control, the ventilator is doing all the work and the diaphragm uh, isn't doing enough work and it will begin to weaken. And that's been shown not to be true. As long as the uh, respiratory rate is not set so high that you abolish spontaneous breathing, the patient makes a a diaphragmatic contraction that is the same as if he were breathing without um, all that mechanical support. When the respiratory center fires, the muscle makes a complete contraction. Another important advantage is the improvement in the VQ. When uh, the patient is breathing spontaneously, he has better ventilation perfusion matching. When the patient is breathing spontaneously, he ventilates the basal and dorsal aspects of his lungs uh, better than if he is having breaths forced down him uh, from a ventilator. The ventilator just kind of pushes down the diaphragm and you don't really get good ventilation and perfusion down there. When the patient is breathing spontaneously, it improves his cardiac output. You've all heard about the thoracic pump mechanism. Uh, especially a patient who is in uh, airway pressure release ventilation, APRV, will have uh, improved cardiac output if he's allowed to breathe spontaneously. And if the patient on APRV is so heavily sedated or paralyzed he's not breathing, uh, his cardiac output will be much lower. So it is important for the patient to be breathing on the ventilator. We want him making inspiratory efforts, but not if he's making inspiratory efforts that are so intense that he causes a patient ventilator-induced lung injury. So uh, there's a couple of things we can monitor to watch for that. And one is esophageal manometry. If we uh, have a, a esophageal balloon in our patient, we can uh, constantly monitor the transpulmonary pressure. Remember that transpulmonary pressure, the uh, uh, alveolar distending pressure. That's the same uh, problem breathing spontaneously as it is if the ventilator is given the breath. If the transpulmonary pressure is too great, uh, it can cause overstretch injury and even rupture of the alveoli. Another measure that mo a lot of modern ventilators have today is called the P0.1. And the P0.1 is the, the drop in pressure at the very beginning of inspiration. In the first 100, 100 milliseconds or one tenth of a second of inspiration, how far does the pressure drop when that patient uh, starts to breathe in? And uh, it should be done against an occluded airway. Uh, and a couple of ventilators allow that to be measured against an occluded airway. Other ventilators out there today uh, will 
tell you the P0.1, but they don't do it against a colluded airway, so it might be um, not quite as accurate. If the patient um, is very air hungry, it has a heightened drive to breathe, he starts to breathe in very vigorously, and that pressure drops very quickly, very sharply, to um, a number of uh, about uh, 6 or 8 or 12. That can be uh, pretty, uh, pretty low. A patient who's breathing very comfortably, uh, the P0.1 is going to be about like minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So that can help to determine if the patient's making uh, inspiratory efforts that are too intense. But if we don't have esophageal manometry and our ventilators don't tell us the P0.1, then we're going to have to just use our um, assessment skills looking at the patient's breathing. How does his breathing pattern look? Is it rapid shallow breathing? Do you see retractions? If the patient looks like he's in a lot of respiratory distress, he may be breathing too vigorously and he may need more ventilatory support. This is an example of a patient making intense inspiratory efforts. We're using uh, esophageal manometry and right here is the esophageal pressure waveform. And uh, when we measure the uh, pressure in the esophagus, we're doing that to get an idea of what the change in pressure is in the pleural space. This is not pleural pressure, but it accurately represents the change in the pleural pressure. So here this patient is exhaling, and now he makes an inspiratory effort, and pleural pressure goes all the way down to here. So the pleural pressure in this patient is going from about 15 or 16 down to zero. Remember the dotted line is zero and then this is 10 and this is 20. So you can see every breath this patient is making, uh, his uh, pleural pressure is going uh, very deep down to uh, minus 15 centimeters of water pressure. So this patient is at risk of developing self-induced lung injury. One way to treat a patient whose inspiratory efforts are too intense is with uh, drugs. Now, that's not always the first choice. Uh, we should try to figure out why the patient is breathing that way and see if we can uh, solve that problem. Uh, if it's anxiety, he may need drugs, uh, but his anxiety might be related to the way the ventilator is set and he's not synchronous with the ventilator or the ventilator is not giving him enough ventilatory support. Also, we can't really use permissive hypercapnia in a patient who's awake and uh, breathing spontaneously. They don't, just aren't going to tolerate that. He may be breathing uh, like this because he's trying to get a big minute ventilation. Uh, the, there's a term called the ventilatory demand, and the ventilatory demand is the minute ventilation a person needs to make his CO2 and pH normal. So the patient may have a really high ventilatory demand and working really hard to try to meet that demand. One thing that can cause the ventilatory demand to be high is a metabolic acidosis. So we look at his blood gas and determine if uh, that might be what's driving him to breathe so hard. Other things can be uh, dead space ventilation. Uh, ARDS patients tend to have a high level of uh, dead space ventilation. If you have the means to measure the VDVT, uh, you might do that to determine uh, if he has a, a, an excessive amount of dead space ventilation. If it's dead space ventilation or metabolic acidosis, he may need uh, more ventilatory support to help him meet his ventilatory demand. Also, a patient who has a fever is going to have a uh, increased metabolism. He's going to be burning more oxygen and producing more CO2, so he's going to have to breathe more. So treating the fever, the pain, uh, anything that you uh, can do to decrease uh, their metabolism will decrease their drive to breathe, and um, that might be the way to treat this patient. Pulmonary oxygen toxicity is indistinguishable from ARDS. And with pulmonary oxygen toxicity, high concentration of oxygen uh, disrupt surfactant production, 
and causes uh, epithelial injury and the cytokines and it sounds just like ARDS. It is ARDS. So we want to try to keep our FiO2 down to a, a level that's considered safe and that's uh, been determined to be 50%. And so when um, we have a patient with ARDS and uh, high concentration of oxygen, the high concentration of oxygen advance the ARDS and cause more fibrosis in the later stages of the ARDS. So the lung is just very susceptible to injury from high concentrations of oxygen. So when the patient is on 70% oxygen and he needs uh, better oxygenation, uh, it's time to turn up the PEEP rather than turn up the FiO2. You can turn up the FiO2 and make the blood gases look better, uh, but you're not helping the patient. When PEEP is optimized and we've at a, we're at a point where we're not recruiting any more lung, we can't get our O2 sats any higher, and we're still on a high FiO2, we may want to consider permissive hypoxemia. Now, permissive hypoxemia doesn't mean that we're going to let the patient suffer tissue hypoxia, but patients with uh, O2 sats of 88 to 90 percent, unless they have uh, some heart failure or some other reason why, uh, they should be able to tolerate um, having sats that low. So if your PEEP is maxed out and your O2 sats are 92 percent and you can turn down the FiO2, that may be beneficial to the patient. You know, it's not just the concentration of the oxygen, but the duration. So a patient can tolerate 70% um, oxygen longer than 80%, and on down to where uh, we're at 50% oxygen. That's the safe place we would like to be. But if we can only get to 60%, that's better than 70%. High CO2s don't cause any permanent damage. But sometimes with a patient with severe ARDS, trying to make the patient normal capnic can often result in ventilator-induced lung injury. So we need to realize that uh, the CO2 being normal is uh, less important than uh, other aspects of uh, mechanical ventilation for an ARDS patient. Everybody pretty much agrees that it's okay to let the CO2 be 70 with a pH of 720. Sometimes with a very severe ARDS, you might have to settle for 7.15 or 7.1. Uh, but remember, it's not the CO2, it's the pH. And um, we can have better outcomes for our patients if we let the CO2 be high in severe ARDS. Of course, we got to... Uh, be careful when we have a patient with a right heart failure, uh, permissive hypercapnia wouldn't be indicated. Uh, and the same with a uh, intracranial pressure that is high, the guy with a closed head injury or some uh, head problem that causes his intracranial pressure to be high, uh, we cannot do permissive hypercapnia for those patients. Back when we used to uh, manage our ventilator with our goal as the patient's blood gas and not lung protective ventilator strategy, you would uh, sometimes see a patient being ventilated like this. Zero of PEEP, 70 of pressure control. Now, we were told that, uh, you know, don't go higher than 50 on your pressure. 50 is the highest safe pressure. However, we would go higher than that if we needed to to treat the patient's blood gas, to make the CO2 normal. We had not yet learned that high CO2s don't cause any permanent damage, but ventilator settings like this kill. About 15 years ago, a study was published looking at paralyzing patients in the first 48 hours of their ARDS. Now we'd been just learning that uh, paralytics are not good and we were trying to get away from them. But this study showed improved outcomes in patients when they were paralyzed with cisatracurium for the first 48 hours of their ARDS. And um, that caught on pretty, pretty well. A lot of doctors were uh, paralyzing their patient right away when they first determined they were in ARDS. Well, about uh, 
10 years later, less than five years ago, the Rose trial uh, was a duplicate of this trial here. Uh, this trial, they only had about 340 patients, and uh, you needed to have a 30% uh, separation with a study that small of patients, and they only saw a 9% separation in the patients. So the Rose trial, they uh, ha had 1,000 patients in the trial, and they used cisatricurium, the same um, drug that they used in the first study and uh, followed all the same protocol, the same types of patients, and they showed, they showed no difference in outcomes for those patients. It did not uh, improve mortality at all. So uh, which one of these studies are we gonna believe? I mean, it's not uncommon for one study to show something and then another study to show something different. It was suggested that perhaps uh, it had to do with proning. Uh, back in 2005 or 6 or whenever this study was done, uh, they weren't really proning very many patients. Not very many of these patients were being proned. But uh, when this trial was done in about 2018 or 2017, uh, a lot of those patients were proned. And that might have made the difference because there was a lot of patients proned in both limbs of the study. Prone positioning has been shown to significantly decrease uh, mortality in ARDS patients. And again, that's something that's done early in the ARDS, and it's beneficial to patients who have a PF ratio less than 150. So if the patient has a PF ratio less than 150 and he's on 60% uh, oxygen or more with at least five a PEEP, he should be prone. And uh, it should be early and relative long sessions. In the study, they proned at least 16 hours a day. Prone positioning has been shown to improve VQ and improve CO2 clearance. The lung is more uh, uniformly ventilated when the patient is proned, and there is a reduction in ventilator-induced lung entry. Prone positioning is only recommended for patients who have PF ratio less than 150. And there are some contraindications with uh, proning. Uh, pregnancy, hemodynamic instability, a patient with an open abdomen or unstable fractures. For lung protection, we should always use the ARDSNET settings of tidal volume around 6 mL per kilogram and keep plateau pressures less than 30. Uh, whatever lung we can recruit is going to be beneficial to the patient and we should uh, make every effort to uh, recruit whatever recruitable lung there is. Uh, we want to keep the lungs open and stable. By stable, uh, they, we're not allowing the open and collapse and open and collapse. That means we recruit and adjust our PEEP to keep the lungs open. We want to evaluate the driving pressure. Keep that less than 15. And if the PF ratio is less than 150, paralyze and prone. To finish up here, I'd like to make a couple of recommendations. I recommend that you measure and monitor compliance and driving pressure in your ARDS patients. And if where you work, the physicians you work with are not looking at compliance and driving pressure, uh, you need to educate them and uh, explain to them the importance of measuring the compliance and the driving pressure. Another thing I recommend is that you watch a YouTube video uh, that Marcelo Amato on driving pressure has put together. Uh, it's extremely important and informative and uh, it's kind of long and it gets pretty deep, but uh, you might have to watch it twice, but it's well worth watching. The other thing I would recommend, the most important things RCPs must know about mechanical ventilation part two, weaning and ventilator discontinuation. It's uh, all of the evidence regarding weaning and ventilator discontinuation or liberation from mechanical ventilation.